<laughs> hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Today I have a very important subject to talk about. And if you're doing switch mode power supplies, which they're all over the place these days, uh, even in audio, you know, so they're just everywhere. So it's a subject that will could save you a lot of trouble and or give you a better understanding of how switch mode power supplies work. And one of the things that this is highly related to is negative resistance or negative impedance. So if you don't know what that is, you will after this video. <laughs> All right, so today I want to talk about the Middlebrook Stability Criterion. Uh, David Middlebrook, he was a professor at Caltech, and in 1976 he came up with this Stability Criterion, which has become very well known and is a very important concept. And uh, I just want to talk about that, kind of show you what it is, and we'll do it the KISS method, keep it simple, right? And I think by the end of this video, you'll have a, a pretty fair understanding of what this thing is, maybe a great understanding. Uh, in some ways, it's not that complex, but it can be. But if you've ever run into a problem where you're trying to power something up with the switching power supply, and there's been a startup issue or something like that, I'll, I think this will help explain that. I was just here at the bench powering up this boost converter and I was having some issues and it ran fine and everything but when I zeroed in with the oscilloscope and looked at the input waveform I saw something I'm like hmm yeah that's interesting so I think it's something to talk about and explain it to you guys and I'll demonstrate it here at the bench too and that way you'll have an idea if you ever run into this problem too which if you're working with switching power supplies which they're popping up everywhere these days, even in audio, right? There's a good chance you'll be working with one. And and if even if you're just interested in t the technology and how they're designed, I think this would be an interesting video. So let's get to my first slide. My slide is my actual whiteboard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Middlebrook Stability Criteria. If we have an EMI filter and a switch mode power supply, this is kind of the classic picture they'll show, a block diagram of, you know, introducing this concept. The EMI filter, if you're looking into it as a power supply, as the power supply is looking into the power, you know, the EMI filter to see what it's going to, you know, see the impedance it has and what power it can give it. And that's called the output impedance of the EMI filter. And now looking into the, power supply that's Zn okay so essentially what this means is that the output impedance of the EMI filter has to be much lower than the input impedance of the uh, power supply so Z out much lower than Zn seems pretty basic right but let's explain this a little bit and I'm going to talk about the negative resistance so you can kind of get an idea how this becomes very interesting all right, so I've simplified the EMI filter, you know, broke it down into uh, L and a C, all right? Now, when you have an L and a C, you get a resonance. And so the impedance could look like this. As you're looking into this, you'll see, at first you'll see this inductive impedance coming up, okay? And then as the capacitor starts to get the high frequency on it, it starts to look more like a short, right? So the impedance drops, but you get this resonance right here. One of the techniques, this peak gets pretty high and you want that Z to be lower than the input impedance of your power supply. So that peak, you often put a resistor here to dampen that out, okay? All right, uh, now here's impedance graphed against frequency. Here's that output impedance curve of the filter. What I did is I just kind of showed the smoothed out one kind of the dampened response of the filter so we get rid of that spike and we just want this whole curve to be lower than the input impedance of the power supply and you end up getting this little curve down here this higher frequency thing and luckily those two things don't usually touch each other you want to make sure they don't so this is kind of the classic graphs you might see if you look up Middlebrook uh, stability criteria and now let's talk about this a little bit more, okay? Oh. All right, so here's an example. Uh, let's say we have 150 watts going into this power supply. 
and we're going to feed it 15 volts. So that would mean we'd need 10 amps, and that comes out to 1.5 ohms input impedance. Seems pretty basic, right? But it's not quite as simple as that. You know, let me show you something here. We're going to get into the negative resistance thing. All right, so what if the input voltage drops down to 10 volts? Then input current would have to go up, right? Maintain 150 watts, it'd go up to 15 amps. And that would mean the, the input impedance would appear to be dropping. And it'd drop down to, say, 0.67 ohms, right? So, you see, as the voltage drops, the impedance is dropping. So that looks like negative resistance. Current is going up. Now, a linear power supply, when you think about a linear power supply, that doesn't happen, right? As the voltage drops, then at a certain point, your output voltage starts to drop out. But a switching power supply is not only, it not only tries to maintain a constant voltage on the output, but it tries to maintain a constant power on the output. So if it needs 150 watts to, to maintain that output power, then when the input voltage drops, it's still going to try to maintain that 150 watts, meaning the impedance has to drop. The power supply is like, give me more current. So that's your negative resistance. All right, guys, so let me just kind of show you this graph of impedances versus input voltage. Uh, so here's our impedance, and what I'm showing you is with different input voltages, what the re, you know resistance or impedance would be. So now this is for the 150 watt case, and in, in, uh, with 15 volts in, we'd have 10 amps, and that would also turn into 1.5 ohms, okay? And let's say duty cycles are like 50% is what we designed it for to give a, you know, more optimal efficiency, okay? So then when we drop the voltage down to 10 volts, then the current has to go up to 15 amps to get that 150 watts, which means the impedance looks like about 0.67 ohms. Duty cycle would have to increase to say 78%, just as an example here. And then if we drop all the way down to 5 volts, then duty cycle goes all the way up, but uh, we get 30 amps, and it turns into an impedance about 0.17, which is almost a tenth of uh, the resistance up here. Now the voltage dropped about two-thirds, and the current increased, you know, about three, three times, right? So it's about a 3x factor in voltage and in current which, you know, voltage times current is power, so that makes sense. But impedance almost dropped, you know, by 10x. And the reason is, is because when you bring impedance into the power equation, it's V squared divided by R, or impedance. So as the voltage drops, the impedance at the input looks like it's dropping like a brick. And that's our negative resistance. And that's what causes... Uh, that's potentially that's what could cause some issues all right so you can see how a switching power supply can really raise havoc as imagine as you're bringing up the input power source slowly and as soon as that power supply turns on it's going to try to provide power to the output and it's going to bring in all the current it can so that can cause some issues so one of the things that us designers do to help keep that from being a problem is we have a thing called under voltage lockout. If voltage is too low, let's say at 10 volts or 12 volts, something like that, then it doesn't turn on. Okay? So as you're bringing the voltage up slow, if your power supply, your lab or your bench power supply can provide 10 amps, then it's not going to be able to provide 150 watts until it hits 15 volts. So in that case, you might want to have the under voltage lockout uh, lock out until you get to 15 volts. Uh, here's another thing is you could just flip the switch on so the input voltage comes up real fast. So you hit that 15 volts. Well, you could run into a problem there because that voltage doesn't come up instantaneously, right? It ramps up. And it might ramp up pretty fast, but it might get caught. And 
And as it comes up, if the switching power supply turns on and tries to pull in, say, 15 amps or 20 amps or something like that, then it loads down your lab supply and it tur turns off. And then it repeats that and it goes over and over. And I can tell you that many a time I've been called by a systems engineer who's putting a power supply that I've designed into the system. And he says, hey, your power supply is cycling on and off. And the first time I got that call, I kind of panicked. That, like, oh, no, what's wrong with my power supply? And then, you know, since then, after it's happened a number of times, <laughs> then what I do is I first ask the guy, well, how big is your bench power supply? And, you know, he's like, oh, your 150-watt power supply is no problem. I've got a bench power supply at, uh, you know, 200 watts. And then I... You know, the next question is, well, how much current can it put out? You know, 200 amp watts might be the, an ideal setup. It might be able to put out 10 amps at 20 volts, but not any more current. So, you know, so you have to find out what what it can do. And he might say, well, I got a 1,000 watt power supply. Your little 150 watt power supply is no problem. Then the next question is, but what do you have your current limit set to on your lab, on your bench power supply? And he's like, oh yeah, I'm protecting your power supply, no problem. You know, I don't want it to be a catastrophic failure, so I've got it limited to 12 amps, just so you got 20% headroom above your 10 amps that you need. I'm like, well, but when it turns on, it might need a lot more current than that. And so he'll crank it up a little bit, and lo and behold, it comes up. So that that's just one of those common things. And here at the bench, when I've got... A bench power supply that can put out 10 amps and I've got one of these guys that wants more current than that at the lower input voltage I can run into problems so uh, I want to demonstrate that okay so here's another thing is sometimes you switch on that power supply it might come up and then sometimes it doesn't and you're you know, it's kind of perplexing. You're wondering, like, well, how come it works sometimes it doesn't work other times? And it could be just because of the ramp of your lab supply, how fast it comes up. The other thing is when these switch switching power supplies are designed, there's another thing called soft start. And what that does is until the output voltage comes up and regulates, the pulse width is limited so that in duty cycle. So that because it knows that it's going to charge a big old capacitor on the output of the supply. So it slowly ramps it up. And so the current limit starts off initially really low. And then it increases over, say, you know, whatever time you set it for. You know, 100 milliseconds, let's say. And then that way it has a soft start. And in that case, that's slower than your bench supply probably. So you probably can switch it on and test it. So, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Alright guys, I want to bring you over to the bench. We're going to power up this guy. And I hope I can make it go back in that mold again. So I can demonstrate what it is when the impedance matching isn't quite right. Okay? Okay guys, uh, this is the uh, LTC3784 eval or demo circuit that I'm testing. And... It's a very interesting dual phase uh, boost converter, which I did a video on. And so here's the input right here. And I've got differential probes coming here. And I've also got the uh, power supply right here. Then on the output, I have differential probes and the leads going up to the active load. All right, guys, look at the probe setup. I've got the mix sig uh, CP2100B. Looking at the output, that's on a 100x setting. And then I've got the DP10007, 10x setting. Looking at the input voltage. And then the output voltage, I got on the DP10013. And that is set at the 50x setting. Okay, and they're going right here to this mix sig. Up here I've got the, uh, the active load, the iTech. DC electronic load, so you'll hear me calling out the currents as I dial that up and down. And then over here, I'm going to be using this Kiwi's power supply that's capable of 10 amps and 30 volts. 
and it'll read out the wattage as well. All right, guys, and the way I had the mix sig set up is channel one is the output voltage, channel two is the input voltage. So 10 volts per division on channel one, the output, uh, it's going to jump up to about 48 volts, I think it is, 45 volts. Channel two, it, we're going to take it up to around 14, 15 volts, somewhere around there. And channel three is the current. So, and that's set up at two amps per division. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the input voltage to 10, uh, well, let's see. We'll go to 15 volts, I guess. Okay, there's 15 volts. Yeah, a little bit above, 15.27. The output's 48.8, and very little current. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick on the 2.5 amp load. And look at that. The, uh, the lab supply is putting out about 8.66 amps. 132 almost 133 watts but look at this it's got a little ripple on it it's it's kind of struggling even there now if I drop the voltage I can hear the fans of the power supply kicking on so I drop it down to 13.3 volts and I got 10 amps so that's the max rated output of the Kiwitz it actually put out a little bit more but you can see it's kind of struggling the output voltage is nice and solid it's regulating but the input is here let me just freeze this for a second see as the current goes up the voltage drops down and then as the current drops then the voltage pops back up so it's sitting there it's got some kind of you know impedance there some lc filter that's going on that's creating this uh, low frequency ripple now here let me get it turned on again okay now watch me when i raise the voltage So having a hard time getting the right one down. Okay, so I just want to bring it down so you can see the voltage there. And I'm almost 17 volts now. I'm right at 17. And look, right there, it starts to smooth right out. And the current's dropped about 6.8 amps. So, yeah, it just goes to show you, even though we were below the rating of the Kiwitz, it was struggling trying to put out that current. Hey, guys, I hope you like that. And I hope it was informative and you learned something. If you liked it, uh, thumbs up for the video is appreciative. It's a free way to help the channel. And, uh, yeah, it helps YouTube and links and all that kind of thing. So I appreciate that. And two thumbs up to Patreons. And, yeah, let me get into a couple of stories here about Middlebrook, okay? Um, years ago, when I was working at a medical laser company, and... Um, I was kind of looking for a change. I had just gotten divorced after 13 years, and it was kind of a rough period. So I sent out some resumes, and somebody told me about a job at Boeing. So like a week later, they gave me a call, interviewed me on the phone, asked me to come out. Well, during that time, I also interviewed with, an, uh, with actually two more companies here in uh, Utah. And one of them I really wanted to take that job. I liked them both, but one of them I really wanted. And so I thought, well, I got to go to Boeing because, you know, it's all set up. I got tickets and everything. So I'm on the plane and I'm thinking, all right, I really want this design job in Utah. And um, I don't, you know, I want to change, but maybe I don't want to move away from my friends and everything. Anyway, I thought, okay, if they hire, if they offer me, you know, X amount of dollars, I'll come. Otherwise, I'm not going to stress myself and I'll just say, oh, sorry, thanks for the interview. So I go out there and I didn't even know if they'd offer me or if they'd offer me that day. But so I go out there and I end up interviewing all day long. And, you know, the boss, my manager took me out to lunch and, you know, went back. One of the final interviews I had, it was with a peer who would have been one of my peers, who became one of my peers. <laughs> I might tell you how the story went. But he, uh, I was kind of sweating bullets. And then I realized, hey, I, I won that job in Utah. I don't really care about this. So, you know, I kind of calmed down. And then one of the questions he asked me is about, you know, what do I think about the Middlebrook criteria? And I guess I looked like a deer in headlights. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. 
And so he asked me some questions. He goes, well, it looks like you know what the principle is and you understand the idea. So that's what we call the Middlebrook criteria. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I know it now. Anyway, I studied it after that to make sure I understood it well. So that's how important it is. You might get asked that on a interview. <laughs> and okay, so now years later, I ended up moving back to Utah. Ended up taking, you know, working for both those other two companies during during the time I've been back. And um, I worked for a defense contractor. And as after I got hired, they were actually doing a job for Boeing, and they're designing the power supply. Well, there's a guy who was assigned the EMI job. He was going to design the EMI filter. And the filter he came up with was huge. And he knew very little about switching power supplies. So he just designed this big thing. Well, so it had a resonance. And that resonance was taking our voltage. I think it was like 400 volts we had. And it was bumping it all the way up to like 500 volts at, at this one frequency. And... He was talking about how we could deal with that. I'm like, wait, we don't want to deal with that. Yeah, that filter has to be redesigned. And I realized that uh, I needed to present this Middlebrook concept. Now, ironically, I actually interviewed with this defense contractor a couple years before. And I ended up taking a different job. So I turned down the offer for the second interview. But I had prepared... A presentation the second interview was to present a subject and I had the Middlebrook criteria on that I thought that'd be a you know a good topic so you know I called them up you know a couple years later and said hey you still looking for a guy and they said you bet so they hired me but I didn't need to interview again they just you know talked to me on the phone and brought me in so I never got to use this uh, presentation and then now working for them I realize I really need to present this to the group so we understand this uh, concept. And so the EMI guys and everybody understands how how important Middlebrook criteria is and what it is. So since that presentation that I did, for years after, uh, I would hear in the hallways, I'd hear in meetings, and, you know, the Middlebrook was always being brought up. So it became a very important concept to that company. And it was talked about all the time because we're designing lots of power supplies and lots of EMI filters. <laughs> so, yeah. So it is a very important subject and that's what I wanted to talk about today. So, there you go. Alright guys, so thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.